England. Um, as the name implies, let's kind of just go over the name. Uh, it's called New England not just for the hell of it. Uh, it has obviously strong connections here uh, to England. Uh, and so it was essentially uh, people who were moving from, migrating from England. Uh, and if they're migrating from there, they're migrating for reasons. Uh, and so various reasons why people were migrating. But essentially what it was is they just were wanting to continue a lot of the English characteristics in this new part of the world over here in North America. <coughs> thus the name New England. Uh, but like I said, the people that were migrating... People, if you're happy, if you're happy in your location, you're not going to move. Uh, and so more often than not, migrants are leaving for reasons. Uh, and so the migrants that initially left and moved over to this area from England were moving because of economic, but also cultural reasons, especially in terms of religion. And I'll come back and I'll explain that a little bit more here in a minute. Uh, if we look at the population density map of New England, uh, and so here's the part that you guys covered is the U.S. part of New England. Is that on? Uh, you guys focus in on this part, but if you look at the rest of New England, what we would call the book New England, including Labrador, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, very, very lightly populated. And there's several reasons for that. Why would you think that this whole entire area would be lightly populated, especially compared to southern New England? Why might there be uh, a reason for this lighter population? Any ideas? It's all islands. Colder. It's colder. So first off, we need to say climate. Climate-wise, this is a much harsher climate, especially when you're on the coast. It's going to be a cold, damp, and wet climate. And so that obviously isn't tolerable for, for discomfort, uh, but also for agriculture. Uh, and so this is going to be an area where we're going to find a lot of industry related around agriculture uh, because of its, uh, uh, its cooler climate. Uh, what else? Relates maybe islands. They get frozen off from the mainland during the winter. They get uh, frozen off during the, the from the mainland during the winter. So um, if you get really further farther up, you can really see that. But here uh, there isn't enough uh, of that situation where you get the the oceans aren't freezing uh, in this area. Um, what else relate to islands? It's going to be more expensive to live there. You've got to ship things in. You, if you want to go anywhere else, you're going to have to take a boat. Or Let's use another word for that, what's called isolation. And so this area here, very much isolated as well. And so northern New England and the Atlantic provinces are also isolated. So first off, climate. Second off, isolated. Kind of related to isolation, the fact that islands, just in their nature, are quite fragmented. And so if we can kind of think about this being one cohesive mass, land mass, here you've got these individual islands. Anytime you have individual islands, geographic fragmentation, you're also going to have political and cultural fragmentation. So you have the fact you have a, a poor climate, not conducive to ag, combined with isolation and fragmentation, have been key to these areas being uh, more lightly populated. Uh, another thing you could say is regarding the, uh, the kind of related to climate is in, in agriculture is the soil here. Uh, the soil here, it ain't too good. Uh, it's quite rocky, uh, it's a lot of undulating hills. If you know anything about ag, ag likes very, very, very flat areas. Here, very, very rugged coastline. Uh, and so you're going to find here, um, it's more rugged, more rockier soils, uh, but also the climate isn't conducive to uh, ag and sustaining large populations. Anything else they wanted to hit? <laughs> Limited resources, uh, for declining jobs. Uh, so another kind of key characteristic, more contemporary, is the decline of jobs. Now, the, the area right through here, declining not so much. Uh, but much of the rural areas, I think you guys mentioned that, as far as rural poverty. Uh, and so rural poverty in New England is a big problem because uh, those industries, those agricultural jobs, anything out there is no longer. Uh, so your best and your brightest are moving away from these rural places. Uh, and so key reasons why more of the northern part, lightly populated, limited resources, um, climate, uh, lack of jobs, yada, yada, yada. All right, now let's look at some uh, place names. And so I'm going to kind of, whenever I'm going to talk about culture, especially here in these initial earlier discussions, we're going to look at place names. And so what I did is I went to Wikipedia, I did all this research, I just essentially Googled lists of places that have an English place name. 
And the place, the, the, place that, the state that has the most number of English place names, Massachusetts. And that makes sense. If you think about why do we get together on Thanksgiving, we get together on Thanksgiving because it all relates to these people that stumbled upon Massachusetts uh, coming over from England. Uh, and so the, where do they, boom, uh, Massachusetts is that first point of arrival. Uh, and so Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, you can see these northern and eastern influence in English place names. Um, Ohio, though, it ain't northern and eastern. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, not too northern and eastern. We got migration. And so as people migrated from these New England areas, they then stopped in Ohio and just called it New Bristol, or they called it New Hartford. Where they, you know, wherever they're coming from, they just essentially attached a new name to it uh, and then kept on with that whole place name. So the English influence you can see in place names. Um, one of the things is I, I, I you know, think about the English countryside. Um, so I googled English countryside, and here's the first pic I saw. Uh, and so the English countryside very much looks like this. And so the people that originally came to New England were coming from a, 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 an area that looked like this. Rolling hills, uh, but you know, some forest, uh, but it's not completely covered in forest. That was not the case in New England. New England was completely covered in forest. And so here, if you're from England, and this is what you know as home, and then you come over here to New England, you see nothing but forested areas, what are you going to do? You're going to clear those suckers. And so the forested areas of New England were very quick, quickly clear. And they were very quickly cleared, and it made sense. People were kind of wanting to recreate their characteristic landscape from back home. Uh, and so early on, we saw uh, heavy environmental degradation. Uh, environmental degradation in terms of logging and removal of trees and forested areas. Uh, so that was very characteristic there when New England in its early years. However, people started to realize that New England, it's got, you know, it's not really great for ag. Yeah, we clear these forests, but, you know, once you know, we clear a forest, it's quite hilly, not good for ag. Ah, uh, if we can get through those mountains and continue to head west, we got all that flat land in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and so oftentimes this agriculture then essentially migrated off. So, so much that we can actually see Mother Nature returning. And so these years of coming through, leveling, and, uh, and, and, and clearing forests, and building these New England villages, because that migration of agriculture has moved, because these people have moved, essentially they've left behind a landscape that Mother, Na Mother Nature is turning back into what it once was. So how do we know that the early migrants heavily deforested this area? Uh, we can just tell by Mother Nature coming back over time, especially as these practices die down. Logging is definitely, uh, has moved somewhere else as far as where we find uh, our trees for timber purposes. Further, the population has declined, so there isn't that local need for, uh, for lumber and timber, and also clearing areas for agricultural purposes. But like I said, this is the Appalachian Mountains meeting the rocky uh, coastline of the Atlantic. Not a good area for agriculture. And so while at first they tried to agriculturalize this area, it wasn't seen as being sustainable long term. And so we can see this kind of this forest cover loss. And so what this is is showing forest cover loss throughout time. Uh, so here's our time. So as we get closer to now, we can see popular, the, the log, uh, sorry, the, the timber population has declined considerably. The amount of forest logs increases, but now it's coming back. Uh, so while the New England population is rising, what's happening is, is a lot of those timber practices have migrated to other regions. Uh, and for the reasons you mentioned already, as far as uh, you know, some, some high costs, uh, the remoteness, uh, so those central located uh, you know, timber areas, particularly Appalachia uh, and uh, uh, parts of, of the Rockies, uh, have served those lo local areas for timber needs much more than just this small little cluster uh, in New England. All right, so now let's go back to 1750. Uh, so 1750, uh, we see all the coast, the east coast, uh, for the most part, is in this uh, salmon color pink. Uh, that salmon color pink relates to the British slash English. Uh, and so there's no doubt that these early towns that we see along the coast, whether it be Savannah slash Charleston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, if you would look at those core areas, for the most part, they all look the same. Uh, those early downtowns, they all look the same. There's not much distinguishing characteristics between these urban areas back way back when they were when first founded. 
And so when the Brits came over here, they brought with them their British customs, their British practices, the way they construct British buildings. However, over time, that changed. Each of these individual areas, however, you know, they started off British, each of these individual areas over time developed their own characteristics, largely due to climate influences, uh, but also some cultural influences uh, that we'll talk about now. All right, uh, and so here we've got two different places. One on the left is New England, and the one on the right, the foundry, the next region that we're going to talk about. And so if we look at the foundry, this is America's oldest residential street in Philadelphia, very distinctively British. This looks very much like, uh, like a lot of those neighborhoods in and around London. And so you can see how this row house, this row house uh, construction, this row house is, this is a kind of, this is characters called row houses, these very narrow, uh, but also all brick. Uh, very much characteristic of British uh, urban areas, but we can see that in Philadelphia. We can see that in parts of Boston, uh, but the only place in New England where we're going to see these row houses are going to be places like Boston, maybe parts of, uh, of, of your bigger cities like Hartford. However, quintessential New England, touristy New England, places in New England that people go to and they kind of, this is what they want to see when they go to New England, are more like this. And so a completely different way as far as uh, a construction of, of homes. Here, pretty much everyone living on top of each other, and very much these row houses are very much like apartments. Here we find the origins of the, of the American, the distinctive American phenomenon, the single family, detached, surrounded by a yard home. You think about it, you know, if you lived in a farm, you lived you know, that way. If you lived in an urban area, you lived this way. It pretty much was an in-between. And as more and more houses were built, especially in New England, further away from the urban area, there were these situations we see very much characteristic of homes that if you live in suburbia. The origins of suburbia can be seen here in New England when they first started constructing these villages with these separate, uh, these separate homes that were separate from each other in which only one family lives in that residence. Further, uh, like I said, here, brick. The New England characteristic village, overwhelmingly wood. And that ties into what I talked about earlier regarding forest loss. And so these are very much wood framed homes. Uh, and so the overwhelmingly, the number one material in these homes is wood, where over there uh, you see it's stone, brick, whatever. Uh, and so another characteristic um, uh, is the wooden architecture. That, of course, carried on, uh, and we can still see that overwhelmingly today uh, in the Midwest and the Great Plains. Uh, another characteristic of, of these early New England villages is. It pretty much, the, they weren't really served like, as cities function as far as places for commerce to happen. Not a lot of commerce happening here. For the most part, these villages were residences, a general store, maybe a courthouse, but all of it centered around a church. Uh, so you find a church and then a uh, home scattered around there, uh, those single family homes. But, as they pointed out, that was very much, the church was a very, very strong part of early New England. If you think about it, the reason why those people were fleeing or wanting to leave England was because they wanted to practice their own religion. Uh, they wanted to pra practice a religion that was different than uh, considered maybe the state uh, church there in England. And so they're coming over here for religious reasons, and so you saw a very, very high re religious religiousness here in the early New England. Is that the case today? No. Not so much. And so, if anything, it's the lowest area uh, for, for religious, religiousness in the United States. Um, so that's pretty much all I wanted to hit there. Um, uh, here's a very distinctive uh, Cape Cod home. So Cape Cod, uh, Cape Cod is that area, uh, that, that kind of that tail that comes off of Massachusetts, and that tail that comes off of Massachusetts, can you all of us see that? So we've got Massachusetts, and it's got this little tail, kind of like that. Uh, that little tail is essentially, that glacier came, it stopped, it pushed all that debris, and then it retreated. And so remember earlier in the semester when I did the whole thing where I showed the glacier stopping and then retreating? Cape Cod is essentially in moraine. It's where that glacier stopped, creating this rugged feature. Uh, so this rugged feature is where we see a lot of these types of homes. These are the early versions, uh, but a lot of them today are those big, huge, wealthy homes. See Martha's Vineyard. See Cape Cod. So another touristy place of New England is Martha, Martha's Vineyard in Cape Cod, where we have this a glacial created feature, but also these big, huge, wealthy homes that are heavily wood constructed. 
uh, one of the characteristics from the early homes, a very distinctive architecture type. Keep in mind, when, when, the, when, the, when the Brits came to the United States, originally, well, obviously it wasn't called the United States, they essentially, everywhere they went, they did everything the same. They brought with them their same practices. But over time, their architecture evolved to fit the local climate. And so, like I mentioned beforehand, a very cold, dry, or sorry, cold, moist, harsh winter. And so you can see the architecture is reflected there. There ain't no big, huge, swinging porches here. Uh, there ain't a lot of ornate features. Because these are areas that have to withstand a very brutal winter uh, and a good amount of precipitation. And so the construction here, you can tell, not, a whole, you know, not what we're going to see when we go to Dixie. Uh, we're going to see all these open porches and all these ornate uh, fixtures uh, because of the, uh, the, the harshness and the bitterness of this uh, uh, particular climate area. Uh, and so one characteristic you find throughout New England uh, is these stones. Uh, these stone walls are kind of left over from wars or left over from, uh, from, from previous homesteads. But the reason why I show this is that underground, underneath this carpet of vegetation is a very rocky surface. Uh, not conducive to ag. Uh, and so, you know, you come out here, you clear, clear a forested area, but then you then start moving around the soil and you come across all this rock. And obviously not too conducive for agriculture. Uh, but these are very much uh, touristy sites also in New England. A lot of old battlefields and these old uh, relics from a previous, uh, from previous era, a pre you know, previous home that was probably since leveled. Uh, but anyway, uh, and so you find these throughout New England. Uh, these kind of these walls that used to uh, demarcate something, um, and so uh, a lot of old cemeteries. Uh, of course, it's the you know the birthplace of America. Is that I think what I heard? The birthplace. Of, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we're going to find a lot of these old cemeteries that are way out, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, that have over time um, have been worn down. You can't see the names anywhere, uh, but have been essentially uh, you know left left so that all the vegetation just kind of covers right over it. So there's tons of these very, very spooky cemeteries that uh, are all throughout New England. Uh, they, would, they say that uh, early migrants to New England uh, were what they call unconventional. Uh, and so what do they mean by unconventional? Like I said, they're leaving for a reason. Uh, so they're leaving, you know, the convention in England is that you practice the, the, uh, the, you know, practice the, the Church of England. So you pra practice a certain religion. And so they're unconventional in the fact that, you know what, we're out of here. We're going to do things our own way. Uh, so we can kind of see this unconventionality, this kind of this, this view of being different pop up in several different instances uh, that we'll talk about uh, here. Uh, further, uh, I think you guys mentioned that this area is a very, uh, it's an area of high education. Uh, so we mentioned this last time regarding uh, New England. Uh, as far as the United States, one of the highest uh, levels of education are individuals from this area. Very, very early on, those early unconventional migrants, they very much stressed education. And so education has been a very important part of New England life ever since the beginning. And if you look at the, this is from a, a, an, art, an article that came out just a, a few uh, months ago, uh, ranking the top ten universities in the entire world, three of them are located right here in New England. Um, uh, 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 Yale in Connecticut, uh, then uh, MIT and Harvard uh, there uh, in Boston. And so the role of education, very, very important here. Uh, this also explains why this area is the number one area for Kindle usage uh, in the United States. And so more, of, more often than not, people in this area have Kindles, uh, e-readers, you know, people that are, you know, are so, uh, so interested in learning more that they actually have to have their reading on the go. Uh, so Kindles, I don't know what a Kindle is, but they're number one there. Uh, I guess it's an e-reader. Anyway, um, anything else to say about that? We'll come back to that idea. All right, let's talk about this New England area. New England uh, uh, area is this entire area, although we only talked about this uh, in the uh, Pecha Kucha. But if you could say the cultural heart, the core of New England, it's in this little area I've outlined right here. So it's Massachusetts, Boston, uh, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, and Hartford, uh, and so all the way over to, uh, to New York City. So this is the cultural heart of New England, pretty much where people have always lived. If you're working, if you pretty much if you lived in this area right through here, your whole life was determined by the fishing industry, or shipping industry, or shipbuilding. Uh, so these areas here, overwhelmingly, all their eggs are in the shipping and fishing uh, industries. Down here, a little bit more dynamic. Uh, so here's a good amount of ag. Uh, you have various types of ags. You got the blueberries, the raspberries, all of that various 
uh, types of, of agriculture, uh, but like I said earlier, you also have other industries popping up. Um, so I think someone mentioned insurance. And so this is an area that has, uh, is where we see a lot of insurance. Uh, this is where you see banking. Boston essentially was a, a military place combined with being a good harbor. Um, so you have these other various reasons why people would want to live uh, in this area compared to the one trick pony of the fishing uh, industry that you'd find there. Various types of jobs uh, found there. However, over time, you've got the Appalachian Mountains right there. You've got this rocky coastline here. As more and more people came from, across, from, uh, from Europe across the ocean to uh, this cultural hearth, it became quite overcrowded. And so what did people do? Yeah, the most plentiful crop in New England are stones. And so what did people do? They got the hell out of there. And so we have what they call the Yankee Exodus. Uh, and so people started to migrate out of this cultural hearth, migrating to the west. And so people from northern Indiana have a strong history of New England heritage. People from Ohio, strong connection to New England heritage. And like I said earlier at the beginning of our discussion, the Adirondacks are right here. Uh, so essentially what they did is they scooted along, they used the Erie Canal, later they used a railroad connection to move further to the west to go to areas in which, hey, there ain't no stones uh, all over our agriculture, all over our soil uh, out here in the west. And so moving for agricultural purposes uh, to uh, places that are more desirable. Further, uh, if you look at where in Indiana do you see the uh, highest educated uh, population? Where in Indiana do you see the best IUPUI students? I'll be honest. More often than not, our best students do not come from Metro Indy. Our best students come from Northern Indiana. Uh, so the best students, pretty much for more than uh, for, for all schools, but at the uh, at the, the K through 12, 12 level, same deal. So very high importance of education stressed here in Northern Indiana. You can see its relic uh, legacy here from its New England hearth. Uh, those from Central and Southern Indiana, uh, our, our our origins are down here from Philadelphia. And we'll talk about that with the foundry next time. Uh, but this Yankee exodus then brought with it uh, customs of education, but also um, uh, architecture as well. And so like I said, the Erie Canal, uh, this here is the uh, New York Central Railroad system, so another key for as far as helping to cause this migration to uh, places along the Great Lakes. And so essentially just skirted along the southern edge of the Great Lakes uh, to uh, the upper Midwest, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, where we see a strong legacy today of, of British influence. All right, uh, so I went back to this image here. Uh, so you know, when we talk about this Yankee Exodus, uh, this Yankee Exodus, it's kind of its, its leftover of all those people migrating for ag, all those people finding better agricultural areas somewhere else, uh, people taking the timber industry to other places, particularly Appalachia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, now Mother Nature's coming back. Uh, so in 2010, this is the same shot, same area, everything's the same. Uh, and so that little barn right there uh, is that right there. So you can kind of see how what left, what's left behind. Um, uh, slowly but surely, Mother Nature comes back. Uh, she's a resilient person, uh, that mother. All right, so here's a typical New England home. Uh, and so this is a home, I Googled image, New England, typical New England home, this is what I got. Uh, so you can kind of see uh, more in the rural areas, but you can kind of see some characteristics as far as it's being colored white, uh, but heavily wood framed. There's no doubt that you can see that legacy in Midwestern places today. So essentially what happened was, you don't see row houses all throughout Indiana. Uh, you don't see those homes I showed you earlier in Philadelphia, all throughout Illinois, Michigan, Ohio. You see more of this whole single family, detached, wooden home. And this here, this is from Coshocton, Ohio. And so this is from right there along uh, that same route. So essentially you can see the influences, no doubt, as far as construction. And so we're brought with it. So your home, I guarantee if you grew up in your nice little uh, cute suburban home, uh, that suburban home has legacies to the New England architectural style uh, which came out of that area. Heavily wood, uh, wood frame buildings uh, on single family detached lots. Uh, do, do, do. People aren't living on top of each other. Do, 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 do. All right, zoom in. Now let's look at the core of the cultural hearth of New England. Uh, so we've got everything along the Connecticut coastline, uh, but here's the first area, the Connecticut River Valley, uh, but also the Boston area. And so Hartford and Boston remain the two main uh, core cities uh, of New England, uh, with no doubt Boston being the capital of New England uh, for sure. Uh, and so this is where we find uh, the most high-density, high densely uh, pop populated areas of New England. 
fire up an aerial photograph of, of Boston. And you can kind of, we'll get to our second distinctive uh, uh, settlement pattern. So we talked about the long lot. Now we got something called the meets and bounds. And this is how we divided up property in New England uh, and much of the East Coast before we started grading everything. So the meets and bounds system we do not see in Indiana. Quick 411 on the meets and bounds system. Uh, so what's kind of what's used over here is the long lot. So once again we've got a river. So now let's do the meets and bounds system, the British system, uh, this early New England system on the other side of the river. And so what they would do is, okay, if we wanted to mark off property. So your property at the courthouse would be described as this. Um, from the bend in the river to the big old granite rock over to the old hickory tree uh, and then uh, back down to uh, let's say what's down here uh, the, the, the uh, maple tree along the river and that's how your property is defined no really rhyme or reason uh, to, know, to use maybe a term we talk about in other classes ad hoc what does that mean ad hoc Not random random exactly completely random so there's no organization to this pattern at all property was just pretty much divided up however people wanted to divide it up. What might be some problems with using the meets and bounds way to divvy up property? What if you move a rock? Mm -hmm. What if you move a rock? R rocks move all the time. I mean, I could go out and move a rock. Maybe well, I could. What well, after P90X and CrossFit I might be able to do? <laughs> Someone could say that their property extends to some tree right in the middle of that property right there. Exactly. So you could say, well, here's a hickory tree. Why, why, why? I thought it's this hickory tree. Yeah. Exactly. Other things. I feel like in modern times, when you're like making roads for cars, it's going to be a lot harder to get through these if they're all like really randomly scattered. The roads are probably all twisty. And Has anybody been to Boston? Yeah. The most difficult city to get around, especially if you grow up and you spend your entire life in the Midwest. You know, here we've got these nicely laid out cities that are gridded. Uh, you know, Indianapolis, for the most part, is gridded. It's got those diagonal streets. It's got the circle. But for the most part, it's a very organized pattern. You go to Boston, and you, you, know, you could be on one street, and it heads north, and all of a sudden it heads a different direction. Uh, so there is no rhyme or reason to the street layout in Boston, which is very much characteristic there. The roads are windy. Traffic is horrible in Boston because there's no, there's no, organized, there's no way to organize that chaos. Pretty much people are going wherever. Uh, it's very much characteristic there. Uh, other things about the meets and bounds system. Kind of jumped ahead there. Rivers move. Rivers change their course over time. Trees die and they fall. And so this was seen not to be too good of a way to divvy up property, which is why the rest of the country uses a completely different uh, system. And so our first system, the long lots in the French. Our second system, the meets and bounds, M-E-T-E-S and bounds system uh, that was used in early New England uh, settlement. And it helps to explain why Boston looks like this. And so here's Boston. If you've ever been to Boston, uh, this is the downtown financial district. They call it, this is a, a big old park. Uh, they call this the Back Bay District. Uh, but you can see this. I mean, it's compared to Indianapolis. You know, this road is winds around. Uh, so it's very much characteristic. It's a traffic congestion problem uh, in Boston. Uh, there's not a lot of highways coming through here. Uh, so what have they done? What might you think they, uh, what have you heard uh, they've done in Boston to help try to alleviate the construct congestion traffic problem? There doesn't have a lot of like roundabouts. Yeah, roundabouts, yeah. Mass transit? Mass transit, they have something called the T. Um, so they definitely have a high usage of, of, of mass transit. Uh, but that makes sense. Unlike Indianapolis, most of them are populated right here. Indianapolis, we're spread out all over the place. Uh, so it's very, very highly dense. Uh, population, which makes sense as far as why uh, the public transportation works. What they did was they essentially built an interstate right underneath the city, uh, something they call the Big Dig. It's one of the biggest transportation projects uh, in the history of the United States, in which they essentially put the interstate right underneath the city. 
Uh, so it's called the Big Dig. Uh, granted, a whole lot of problems because of the water table. Uh, so if you dig too far, you're obviously going to hit water, uh, especially when you're right there on the coastline. Uh, but extremely expensive uh, project to essentially circumvent this congestion traffic problem uh, that's created from uh, the, the high density but also the, the, the layout of the city. So there's Boston. Um, if you've been there, you can relate to it. Um, further, uh, we think about this area, like I said, highly educated population, uh, so much that, you know, here's just in Boston, I think there's 58, yeah, 58 uh, colleges or universities in metropolitan Boston. 58. Uh, I think, once again, that showcases the uh, importance of education here. And so what's happened is Boston has kind of gone from being a shipping area, uh, textile industry, to what we call a technopole. And so because of this high cluster of education, uh, but also med schools, uh, technology firms, this area has been called a technopole. A technopole is a technological area that continues to attract other technological companies. And so you start to develop a competitive strength in technology. Guess what? Technology companies are they going to come in there and invest in your area to further add to this competitive advantage they have. The only other area I would say that rivals uh, this, uh, this area of the country, as far as the uh, technological innovation, would be San Francisco in that area. We call that Silicon Valley. Uh, but once again, this is where a lot of ideas, uh, innovations originate. Uh, they come from these, edu these uh, uh, very, very good schools um, uh, here uh, that we see sprinkled out throughout all Boston. Uh, and so there's downtown Boston right there. Uh, and so MIT, Boston University, Harvard, the three biggest ones are all clustered right here in this area. Uh, and so here's where you see very, very highly educated populations surrounding those areas there. Uh, but like I said, techno pool, why does that matter? Places that create new ideas are places in which are going to be jobs. Jobs aren't going to be sticking around Pittsburgh if Pittsburgh keeps on st you know, staying there, you know, doing the steel thing. Pittsburgh realized they've got to innovate, innovate uh, and, and, and invest more in technology. Uh, Indianapolis has invested more in technology, particularly in the medical fields. Uh, so that's why we have a kind of a competitive advantage in technology related to, to medicine. Uh, but <clears throat> this area will continue to be, uh, you know, continue to grow, continue to become more international as more people move uh, for this for uh, the various higher educated, uh, higher education reason, uh, reasons. Uh, if we look at this area here, compared to the other regions we're going to go to, probably the most pure or one of the most pure, uh, pure. It's probably a bad term to use. Uh, most in which the population is the least diverse. Uh, for the most part, everywhere in New England, people are white uh, or, or, or Caucasian. Uh, you see some sprinkling of Latinos, especially. Uh, it's increasing more recently. Uh, and so orange represents uh, Latinos. And so our bigger cities are, are finding clusters of Latinos here and there. Uh, but African Americans, unless it's Hartford or, or Boston, you do not see many African Americans here. Um, if I zoomed in close enough, you'd find a, a considerable amount of Asians in Boston, but once again, that relates to the education. Uh, so we talked about how, um, uh, especially the, early, the initial migrants, not so much their kids, uh, but the initial Asian migrants, very highly educated. Uh, very highly educated. And so we can see and understand why they would be clustering in uh, those areas that we find all those schools. Uh, now the children, uh, things have changed. Uh, but this is a map that shows pretty much how pure uh, and how undiverse uh, or lack of diversity we find here in New England. Uh, but those who, uh, who we kind of think about you know, what are the groups that do uh, amongst those white uh, populations, what do we find here in abundance? Italians, Irish, and English, but mostly uh, Italians, Italians and Irish. And so uh, if we see any migrants Especially over the last 100 years, 150 years, it's mostly Italians and Irish uh, that have heavily dominated this area, and we can still see that legacy today. Uh, the Irish, no doubt, have a huge role in Boston uh, throughout much of New England, uh, but also uh, the Italians. Uh, so, you know, if you go to uh, Connecticut, Connecticut's heavily influenced by Italians. Had no idea, but if you, you know, uh, tons of, of pizza places, tons of places to get Italian food in Connecticut. Had no idea until I visited there. Uh, and you can see that legacy still today um, all throughout the, um, uh, the Italians. And the, I know I'm saying Italian wrong, but whatever. Um, so, other than the Italians and the Irish, why has there been minimal migration to New England? 
So we've got the Italians and the Irish. Why do we not really see too much migration happening there? Question mark. Because it's already so densely populated. So you could say that. So the cities are already pretty densely populated. Okay. Cost of living's high, no doubt about that. So cost of living's high, and keep in mind, if you're a new migrant, you're not going to be moving to areas that are expensive to live. I um, mean, you know, you're you're pretty much you're going to be in your home country below uh, uh, the poverty line. That's why you're getting the hell out of there. If, you, if things are great back home, you'd stay there. Agriculture is key. If you look at where a lot of new migrants that are coming into the United States, what are they doing? They're doing they're working in agriculture. Uh, so they're working in agriculture. We don't see much ag here. We see a whole lot more agriculture throughout the rest of the United States. So new migrants, particularly Latinos, are going to be moving here because there's no ag. If there is ag, it's already been, you know, the people are already, you know, have divvied up who's doing it. Um, also, the fishing industry is pretty big. Uh, so the fishing industry is big. And so, once again, people who grow up their whole life in the fishing industry are going to probably keep on working. So there's not going to be an all sudden demand for people working in the fishing industry especially since the amount of fish in this area has gone down considerably over the last 150 years. Uh, other things, construction. Uh, New England is not a fast-growing area. Apart from those big urban areas, there's not a lot of new construction. So new migrants today are working in ag or construction. Two things that aren't really thriving here in New England, helping to explain why there's not a lot of new migration to, uh, to New England. Adding in the cost of living and kind of the socioeconomic barriers, uh, it also helps to make uh, make that point clear. Now, New York City, it's a whole different deal, and we'll get to that and explain that a little bit later on when we talk about the foundry. Uh, and so, all right, so this is a map that shows uh, where in the United States they use the gridded pattern. The gridded pattern is a pattern I have yet to describe. It's so pretty much everywhere else besides the British influenced colonies and our good friend Texas. Uh, Texas actually uses the long lot. Uh, system. As far as when they first originally uh, laid out Texas, of course that is Texas's characteristic to do stuff on their own, uh, but they did the long lot system there. Uh, the rest of the country uses the gridded pattern here. Uh, so the gridded pattern is ex you know, exactly why our townships are the way they are, why they're nice little rectangles, uh, why we have roads like Township Line Road or Range Line Road. Uh, all those relate to this gridded pattern created by Thomas Jefferson in which the entire rest of the country was mapped out and gridded. Uh, so we can see this pattern all throughout here, meets and bounds system, uh, was the overwhelmingly way uh, that uh, land was divided up. Uh, we'll, so next, or actually two times from now, we'll come back and we'll explain the gridded pattern a little bit more. We'll talk about that uh, then. All right, what do we got here? What are the key differences? But there, there's that question. There's a question I mentioned earlier. Uh, so, Quebec long lot. And so I hope you can draw and explain the Quebec long lot system. New England meets and bounds. So I hope you can uh, uh, describe and uh, this, you know, this kind of understand the nuances of the New England meets and bounds system. Find the breadbasket, the grid system. I'll come back when we talk about the breadbasket and explain the grid system and how it's the system that we know so well uh, and how that was, became a much more efficient way to divide up property, especially all that flat land. The grid pattern is perfect for popping right on top of flat land. Of, of course, the grid pattern wouldn't really work over the Appalachians as well. Uh, so all that flat open land uh, that is the Midwest and Great Plains was divided up using uh, this different uh, gridded pattern. Uh, here's your typical New England village. Uh, it's the painting um, uh, that describes uh, the New England village during the textile mill era. I don't know, did you mention the textile? I think you did. That's, yeah, you talked about how the textile mills have been abandoned, but now they're reconverting into different uses. And so, think about if we go back to uh, kind of the economic history of New England, uh, initially, uh, what was really successful at was textiles, uh, was creating clothing. Uh, and so. Uh, as we had more and more people moving over here uh, to New England, to this area of the country, combined with the fact that industrial relations, the high birth rates, there was an increasing population, people were living longer, and so we got more and more and more and more, more people. There became desire for more and more clothes for those people. And so the textile industry really started to flourish up here in New England. Uh, so 
this, this textile uh, mill dominates, dominated for uh, much of, uh, of the, uh, the 1800s and 1900s. Uh, so if you would have, if you're in the 19 teens and you went out and you looked at your shirt where it was made, uh, I don't know if they did that back then where it was made, uh, most of it was New England. However, uh, after World War II, this then shifted to the South. Uh, so textile milk production after World War II really moved big time to uh, the South, to places like Georgia, South Carolina. That's then where uh, people would, that would be making textiles. Why, did, why do you think it might have moved from New England to the South? Why did the textile mill industry or textile industry move? Slaves. What's that? Slaves. Slaves. Uh, slaves are. Keep in mind, slaves are. Um, the, slave, the, abol uh, the ending of slavery happened um, before this move. So it doesn't have to do anything with slaves. Resources available, like the cotton down there? So resources, first off, cotton. Uh, so we talked about that before, and Dixie's got that cotton uh, uh, industry that dominates. And so boom, uh, location to all, next to all of that cotton. Uh, which, uh, yeah. And, and so we think about cotton. Uh, cotton is more than just clothes. Textiles are more than just clothes. Textiles are also carpets, rugs. Uh, so the carpet and rug industry, Dalton, Georgia, uh, was another key area uh, for the textile mill industry. Still is today. I think Dalton, they still sell a bunch of carpets and rugs. Uh, but it's another area right there in uh, the Dixie area with that cotton belt. Uh, a more important reason other than cotton. Unions. Or the lack thereof. Uh, so unions. Uh, so I don't know where that came from. Where did it come from? Unions, lack thereof. And so, uh, essentially, the moral of the story, cheaper labor. You can find cheaper labor in the South. Uh, so the labor got too expensive. If you're a textile mill operator, you can find a bunch of, you know, uh, you can find a whole lot, I'm going South. Uh, you, down in Dixie, uh, you can find a whole lot cheaper, uh, you know, accessibility to cotton because of it being located right there. But more importantly, cheaper wages. Uh, labor was a whole lot cheaper. Um, so then the textile industry moved from New England to uh, the American South. However, more recently, that then has another migration. Uh, so we'll come back, we'll talk about that with Dixie, but uh, the textile industry now, China, India, Mexico, uh, it's gone further. It's essentially textiles, it doesn't take much to do it. It doesn't make, take much to make a shirt. It doesn't take uh, uh, any, any education at all. And so China, Southeast Asia, uh, places that have a high plethora of lower educated individuals, we now see them uh, thriving, you know, the textile industry going there for the cheap labor. Uh, so you can pay someone a buck a day uh, to work in a factory, of course you're going to do that. And so now in South Carolina and Georgia, they've got the abandoned mills that are sitting there, uh, just decaying uh, and just becoming an eyesore of the rural landscape. And there they're doing the same thing in Georgia. Uh, they're doing the same thing. I visited an old mill in which they're reconverting it into um, uh, condos and all this kind of progressive stuff. Um, same idea with that. I think what they were doing with that one mill, uh, which they're uh, recreating, uh, I don't know, apartments. I don't know what they were, would be doing with it. Uh, anyway, uh, it, uh, uh, men or women, uh, but probably men. Uh, what fish is this? Hi. God. God. Good, you go, girl, exactly. Uh, this is the Atlanta Cod. Um, since 1750, a number I know, not a number you have to know, uh, but a number I know. Since 1750, 99.6% of the Atlantic Cod have been wiped out. 99.6% of the Atlantic Cod. So 0.4% of the amount of Atlantic Cod that were around in 1750 are still there today. How is that an issue? Uh, so in those places that are heavily dependent on, on the fishing industry. Uh, this is called, I think, the beef of the sea. I think cod. Cod's pretty much in every fish. If you go to Long John Silver's, it's all cod. Oh, Long John's. Oh, it's so good. Um, uh, your, 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 uh, your fish that you put into an oven and bake from Gordon's or whatever. Fish sticks. Fish sticks, cod. Fish, fr um, uh, fish fries are mostly cod. Fish fries, cod. Uh, 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 cr imitation crab, cod, uh, a lot of cod in it. Uh, so Atlantic cod, you can see how it's, you know, it's something that's obviously in high demands in various, uh, various things we eat. What happened was this area has become overfished. Uh, so essentially what's happened is uh, the, the fishing industry has essentially killed itself. It's area in which there's no more cod left. 
And so that number one industry for most of those north, northern New England and North Atlantic provinces is really suffering right now. Uh, and so another reason for out migration is the dying and decaying fishing uh, industry in this area of the country. Um, uh, and that's all related to uh, the overfishing, the overexploitation uh, of land cod uh, in this area. Uh, did you do anything else with that? What about lobster? Um, lobster. Uh, and so, it, great, I'm glad you said that. Uh, lobster is actually, it's found in so, it's so much abundance there in, in New England uh, that there they don't really think of it as a delicacy. Here, lobster, I mean, I, whenever growing up, lobster was, man, it was either New Year's or it was a birthday in the family. If someone was having lobster, it was a really, really big deal. Out there, it's all over the place. Lobster is very easy to find. Uh, and so lobsters have actually increased. Uh, why? It has to do with the cod. I don't know, my, I, I, I did do my homework on uh, the food chain here, uh, but the depletion of cod has actually caused an increase in lobsters. So there must be some type of connection there in the food chain. Once again, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Uh, but uh, uh, so that there is actually an increase in the amount of lobsters. Uh, but like I said, out there, lobsters are kind of almost, you know, they're just like a rat, they're everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so they're not really something that's unique and rare. Uh, but they definitely put lobster in everything. But it's kind of become more of a, a, of a cultural icon than I think what it, you know, than what it is in reality. It's become this, this very much this extravagant, uh, fine dining, surf and turf uh, cuisine, anyway. Uh, to, to 10 years from now, ah, yeah. Uh, so uh, why I showed this, this quote here, I came across this, in 10 years from now, I do not believe there will be fish here. This is a guy in 1912 that was recognizing, even way back, when, uh, way back then, uh, the depletion of the fishing industry uh, there. And I think this was a plea made to the, uh, to the United States government that, hey, we need to do something with quotas, we need to uh, kind of uh, control uh, the amount of fishing that's done in this area. Uh, it's hard to control, I mean, especially uh, before we had you know, sophisticated surveillance techniques. Uh, pretty much anyone could come in and fish this area. Uh, so, uh, but now, of course, it's easier to monitor. Some current issues in, uh, nice, some current issues in New England. All right, so we talked about the immigration. Immigration with an E means people are leaving, exit. Uh, so I wasn't around when geographers started making up terms. Uh, but immigration with an I means people coming in. Immigration with an E means people taking off, people leaving. And so New England's had this problem of out-migration. Other than, once again, Boston and Hartford, those urban areas, has had an out-migration. And so this is also another key thing that relates to this, a term we talk about G110, human geography. They've had a brain drain. Uh, so there's been a brain drain, uh, in particularly in those rural areas of New England. They're best, they're brightest, they're not sticking around those rural villages. They're moving to Boston. They're moving to New York City. They're moving to Indianapolis. They're moving somewhere else. They're moving where, there where there's jobs available. Uh, so the out-migration is becoming a key issue. Uh, and so when uh, these rural places, when they lose their best, their best and their brightest, uh, they're left behind with poor leadership. Further, uh, one of the things is this kind of, we talked about that revitalization of the, uh, of the mill. Um, a lot of those wealthy people from Boston, wealthy people from Hartford, wealthy people from New York City are now finding this desire to have second homes in these rural New England towns. And so what they're doing is they're buying up a lot of these older New England homes, renovating them and using them as second homes or retirement homes. Why is this a bad thing for the local area? Why is this a bad thing for Joe the Plumber from, Dan or from Dover, Vermont? Well, increases the desire to live there, so it's more expensive. Exactly. It raises the cost of living. And so when you have wealthy people bidding on a house, they're going to outbid you. Uh, and so lower income individuals are finding a difficult time finding housing, especially now that the demand, or sorry, the surplus of homes is being filled by people who are outbidding them, who can buy, uh, buy that house for a whole lot more. Uh, so it's becoming very hard, uh, and it's increasing the cost of living and cost of, of renting, uh, the cost of buying homes, uh, particularly in those uh, desirable, uh, amenity-rich, rural New England villages. Further, uh, there's been a decline in what we call the secondary sector. Once again, I defined the secondary sector last time. Uh, so there's been a decline in manufacturing, uh, particularly like shipbuilding. Uh, shipbuilding, of course, if you this makes sense, it used to dominate this area, uh, but now it's since globalized. And so now China, uh, Japan, uh, the whole entire West Coast is doing a lot of, of shipbuilding. Uh, so it's not just clustered here in this area. 
further, where's a lot of trans-ocean uh, trade occurring? It's not occurring all across the Atlantic anymore. Uh, so this is, is no longer a highly trafficked corridor. Where is it occurring now? A, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so it's this area which is becoming a more highly uh, shipped uh, uh, ocean, trans-ocean uh, shipping. Uh, and so because of that, the shipbuildings occurred more over here because of this desire, this demand, uh, this higher con uh, quantity, uh, but also quality of shipping um, uh, we find there along the west coast, which is essentially the cause of migration. Because you're not going to build a ship that's going to be used over the Pacific. You're not going to build it over here because you're going to have to then take it all the way around and figure out how to get it over here uh, to the west coast because it's obviously such a big, huge uh, item. Anyway, uh, continued decline of the cod industry. It has. Continue to uh, decline the cod industry, and so the decline of the cod industry is going to continue to hurt that primary sector. Uh, or sorry, the primary sector, uh, yeah, primary sector cod fishing uh, is going to decline, and that's going to be, you know, especially for the way of life of those people along the coastline, uh, in which your whole family, I don't watch the fishing shows, but uh, uh, your whole family's grown up doing this, uh, and that's slowly uh, going away. Uh, so the cod industry f uh, is floundering. Uh, also, sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise. We look at where Boston's located. Uh, Boston's located right there along the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and so there in Boston, they're very much concerned about sea level rise. Uh, if you get one meter sea level rise, most of what we know today as Boston will be underwater. One or two meters sea level, that's about that much. Uh, so one of the things is sea level rise, if you're, you know, this does, has nothing to do with global warming, global climate change. The sea levels have been rising for the last thousand, for several thousand years now. Uh, that sea level rise is inevitable. And so as that rises, it's going to become a key issue in Boston, uh, but other places along the coast, but particularly there uh, in Boston, we see a lot of people clustering uh, located. 